Thank you for visiting the YouTube channel for bestbiblecommentaries.com. In this video, I'd like to show you the Revelation volume in the Reformed Expository Commentary series. Before I do, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to this channel to see videos on Bible commentaries, study Bibles, and other resources that help people understand God's Word. Richard D. Phillips is the author of Revelation in the REC Commentary series. This commentary was published in 2017. It's 764 pages in length, and the, the approach of this commentary series is expository, which means that the content in the commentary reads very much like a sermon would. Richard Phillips is the pastor of Second Presbyterian Church in Greenville, South Carolina. The theological approach, broadly speaking, that Phillips takes to the book of Revelation is evangelical. The end times perspective he has on the book is amillennial, and he is also reformed. He describes his approach to the book of Revelation. He likens himself to G.K. Beale, who, re who wrote a very well-reviewed commentary on the book of Revelation in the NIGTC series. He says in the preface, Richard Phillips does, that he derived, quote, great value from writers of other theological perspectives on the book of Revelation, premillennialists, postmillennialists, and others. He said he derived great value from uh, reading their commentaries during his research. He also mentions, in particular, um, his mentor and former pastor, James Montgomery Boyce. And... James Montgomery Boyce was premillennial, um, and Richard Phillips makes a note in the preface of how helpful um, James Montgomery Boyce was to his understanding of Revelation, even though they had different perspectives on the book. James Montgomery Boyce was preaching through the book of Revelation a few years ago when he passed away. He was um, writing a manuscript in conjunction with his sermon series to uh, be published as a commentary, but only got through Revelation chapter 7, uh, and then he passed away. What's, what's really neat about this commentary is that Richard Phillips utilizes those unpublished manuscripts from James Montgomery Boyce, his former mentor and former pastor, and he incorporates them in this commentary. He references them and he cites them. He uses them in the first seven chapters, even though James Montgomery Boyce had a different end times perspective than Richard Phillips. It's a neat illustration of unity and I think also just honoring a former mentor and pastor to, to make sure that James Montgomery Boyce manuscripts on Revelation um, did find its way into a commentary as they were intended to do. Let me show you an example of the content from Revelation chapter 15. This series utilizes the King James, uh, New King James commentary series. And as I said before, an expository commentary series reads a lot like printed sermons, with, with some editing, of course, um, but, but they read a lot like printed sermons. So when you come to uh, Revelation 15, this section, this passage is titled By the Sea of Crystal, and then you have an introduction that looks like it's about two, two or th three paragraphs in length, and it reads like a sermon, like a sermon introduction. And then you have these subheadings, God's wrath finished and salvation through judgment are, are two examples. And this is where Phillips is diving into the verses. So one thing to note here, if you're going to use this as a reference tool, is there, the verses are not listed in the subheadings. So um, this section, God's wrath finished, covers 15.1, Revelation 15.1. The second section, salvation through judgment, covers Revelation 15.2, I think through verse four or five. But so my point is, though, if you are using this as a reference tool, which I'm sure you would, uh, that's the way that you would use it. Um, you, you have to hunt a little bit to find if you're saying, I, I, I want to know what Philip says about Revelation 15, five, you do have to hunt a little bit because the verses aren't listed in the in the subheadings. This is, it's so easy to read and it's so accessible and don't, and when I say that it's easy to read and accessible, don't take that to mean it's superficial or, um, or introductory. Um, it is, um, it is in-depth 
but it is also devotional in nature. It's in depth, but it's also it's theological in in nature as well. Um, and that's what we mean by an expository commentary series. That that pastors can pastors will use ex, expository commentary series um, if they want to have an example of how did someone preach through this passage? So maybe a pastor can explain the history or the theology behind the passage, but how exactly does this passage look in a sermon form? An expository series will give you, will give you that perspective and just give you an example of it. Another thing expository, the expository approach to commentaries will do is it actually provides a devotional aid. It's an in-depth devotional, but it can be can be read as as a devotional because since it's preaching there's application elements to to the commentary uh, one thing i want to note is that richard phillips did a question and answer for me on this volume on my website and i'll put a link down below in the description box so if you want to read um, richard phillips in his own words describe this commentary in response to my questions um, that ought to give you even more information let me give you a few examples of uh, how Richard Phillips interprets the book of Revelation by looking at some key verse, a few key verses and key passages. And these are these verses are important to premillennialists and all millennialists. So usually if you look up these particular verses in a commentary on Revelation, you have a very good idea of what the author thinks about um, about the book and how to interpret it. The first one is Revelation 3.10. And it says, the verse says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who will dwell who dwell upon the earth. So that's the NASB, Revelation 3.10 in the NASB. Um, so premillennialists will cite that verse. It's, it's often a go-to verse for a lot of premillennialists, not all, but a lot of premillennialists. That's a go-to verse saying, say, um, saying, see, God is going to rescue his people from the time of tribulation, and so they won't go through it. And then they, they build a case, premillennialists will build a case on the, the rapture based in part on that verse. Amillennialists, of course, will understand that differently. Uh, Philip says, it is not that the Philadelphia church, that's, that's the context of Revelation 310. It is not that the Philadelphia church would be removed from the tribulation to come, but that it would be kept safe in and through the tribulation so as not to become overcome by God's judgment on the world. Now, if you don't know what Richard Phillips reflects there is, is the common understanding um, of Revelation 3.10, that the verse isn't saying that God is going to protect all believers and therefore rapture them before the time of tribulation. What it's saying is that God will um, save people through the tribulation, not remove them from the tribulation, but they will experience tribulation and but um, be kept safe through it. Phillips, interestingly, in that passage, Phillips notes uh, in that passage in the in the commentary, uh, Phillips notes that a remnant of Christians remain in Philadelphia, which is in modern day Turkey, uh, though it has been conquered by Christians and or con conquered by non Christians and experienced natural disasters and experienced all the Christians have experienced horrible things throughout the centuries in um, in that city. There's still a remnant of Christians there today, and so Phillips cites that. Um, in his commentary on that section. Another one is Revelation, thir Revelation chapter 13, which is a passage about the beast, and uh, premillennialists will often interpret the passage in light of um, a future, future antichrist figure coming, and uh, amillennialists, though, have a different interpretation and in the in the introduction to that section, again, which reads like a sermon, he he starts, um, he gives his position away. If we didn't already know it, he gives his position away in, in the very first sentence. He says, "In studying Revelation, we constantly need to realize that we are not reading future history out of a newspaper, but are learning the spiritual realities of our present age through a visionary prophetic picture book." So. It's an articulate way to state the um, the common amillennial understanding of Revelation chapter 13. So what is the beast then? Well, to Phillips, the beast represents the entirety of violent earthly empires that oppose Christ's people. So what is the 
the head wound and the apparent resurrection, um, he goes through the perspectives that some say it's Nero, um, but that's not his take. He says maybe it's the Roman Empire, um, but he says that the even better interpretation is that it's actually Satan who was defeated on the cross, yet is still active afterward. It gives kind of a, uh, and that gives the appearance of a resurrection, that he's defeated but still active. And um, he actually, uh, Phillips actually follows G.K. Beale in that particular interpretation. Revelation 20, one of the most famous of the book, and, and um, really a key passage in, in what divides people of different end times positions, is um, Revelation chapter 20, the beginning of it, describes the millennial period. And premillennialists will argue that that's a literal 1,000 years in the end times following the seven-year tribulation. And all millennialists understand that the number 1,000 is symbolic and it's a description of the church age. So it's happening right now. So not surprisingly, <laughs> consistent with all millennialism, Richard Phillips, um, he actually begins this section with a nice note of unity, um, similar to, to um, how he was T discussing his pastor and mentor, James Montgomery Boyce, he, he begins by saying, you know, the, the passage is so divisive. And he says that differing millennial views do not justify deep rifts among believers. Uh, so um, it's a nice statement of unity. And then he uh, dives into um, defending his all millennial position um, and he is cordial toward other positions, but he certainly defends the all-millennial position. He, under, he explains that he understands that the 1,000 years is symbolic and it's a description of the church age, which is happening right now. I think one helpful thing, if, for those who aren't familiar with this conversation, one helpful thing is that throughout this passage, he doesn't just explain his position. He's constantly referencing premillennialism and explaining his all-millennial perspective um, against premillennialism. Again, it's cordial, but um, it's very clear that he is all millennial. <laughs> His convictions are all millennial. So um, I hope this video has been helpful to you in understanding more about this uh, volume on Revelation. I'll put some more information down below and include some links. Be sure and check out that question and answer if you're interested. Thank you for watching this video. Thank you for visiting bestbiblecommentaries.com.